Well, thank you so much. Good morning, everyone. I'm delighted to be here with you this morning. I'm going to set up my laptop here. It's very high tech. Um, thanks for that introduction. It's, it's my great pleasure to be with you all this morning. I'm especially happy to be here uh, when it's fall. I'm from living in LA. And I've just been enjoying the colors. When I arrived, it was cold and rainy, and a number of people apologized for that, and I was just actually very thankful for the cold and the rain. In LA, we get spectacular reds and oranges and yellows, but unfortunately, they're from wildfires, not from leaves. So um, LA has a few weeks of green after the winter rains, and then it's basically a brown apocalypse. So I'm just very thankful to be here in beautiful Lookout Mountain. Um, I haven't quite gotten on the pumpkin spice latte bandwagon yet, uh, but for those of you who are, I know that you're excited about it being fall as well. But um, October is a wonderful month, not just because it's fall, but um, as was mentioned, we're here to celebrate the Protestant Reformation, and that's what I want to talk to you about today and tomorrow. Why do we still celebrate this day, 500 years after the fact? Well, there's a number of reasons. The Reformation, it was a cataclysmic event. It revolutionized the world. It affected everything, culture, art, music, literature, science, politics. It caused society and culture to flourish in many ways, and its influence is still felt today. I mean, even just the fact that we're all here in this room right now, it's because of the Reformation. We would not be here if not for the Reformation. But most importantly, the Reformation was a rediscovery of the gospel. And a large part of that was due to Martin Luther. And there we go. There's the classic picture of Luther. Luther was a priest. He was a theology professor. And he struggled deeply with the question of how he could come before a righteous God. And I really appreciate the psalm that was read this morning. It's a beautiful psalm, psalm talking about God's righteousness. But Luther knew that God was a holy God, a righteous God. And he knew the profound darkness and weight of his sin. And he despaired that there was any way humans could have a relationship with a thrice holy God. So Luther spent years undergoing painful agony. He literally starved himself. He literally beat his body, went to endless numbers of confession, hours and hours of confession, so much so that the person he was confessing to said, go, I don't want to talk to you anymore. I don't want to hear any more about your sins. He endured sleeplessness, all in the hope of making it possible for him, as a sinner, to be able to approach a holy and perfect God. Now, Luther also regularly rotated through the books of the Bible in his preaching and teaching. And it was in a large part through Luther's study of the book of Romans. There he is with a very happy face <laughs> teaching. Um, it was as he studied Romans that it really he finally understood the gospel and found the answer to his search for a gracious God. Luther, in his introduction to his commentary on Romans, would write, quote, It is well worth a Christian's while, not only to memorize Romans word for word, but also to occupy himself with it daily, as though it were the daily bread of the soul. It is impossible to read or to meditate on this letter too much or too well. The more one deals with it, the more precious it becomes and the better it tastes. I'm not going to require you to memorize the book of Romans word for word, but um, it's a great aspiration. So, t But today and tomorrow, I want to take us through the beginning chapters of Romans, in a sense with Luther, walking alongside Luther to challenge us, us to question whether we, as inheritors of the Reformation, because we are the inheritors of the Reformation, do we really and truly understand the gospel? Has the good news of God's salvation reached deep into the core of our being? So today we're going to look briefly at Romans 1 and 2 to ask the question, why do we need a gospel? Or even before that question, do we even need a gospel? 
So Luther also stated that Paul's letter to the Romans is purest gospel. Sinclair Ferguson, you might know his name. He's a great preacher and theologian. But as, as Ferguson recounts this comment of Luther's, Ferguson says he wanted to go back in time and ask Luther, what do you mean Romans is, is purest gospel? Do you mean it's the purest letter? It's, it's not a gospel. We have four gospels, right? Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Romans is not a gospel. Um, didn't they teach you anything in that monkery? Um, and the, the fact is, though, that Luther knew that Romans was not one of the four gospels. He, he did know that. But Luther was making a profound point. He was making the point that in one sense, we can't grasp the significance of the gospels, of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, until we see why we need a gospel. The gospels tell us about Jesus Christ, who is the heart and the center of the good news of the gospel. Jesus is the bringer of the gospel. But until we understand and realize that we need good news, the gospels themselves can mean relatively little to us. So when we turn to the book of Romans, and if you have your Bibles, um, you can turn there with me, but we see the Apostle Paul following the same line of logic, the same line of argument. He begins the letter to the Romans with the goal of explaining the gospel and then showing why we need it. And the first few chapters of Romans are rather painful. I don't know if you have them in your mind. Um, we'll look at some of the verses from them, but they're painful verses. And, and this is the path that we're going to proceed this morning. So um, here we go. The summary, just to get us up to speed. I want to focus on chapter 2 of Romans, but I want to get us up to speed. So in the first chapter, few, first few verses, Paul describes himself in Romans 1, 1 in relation to the gospel. He says he's set apart for the gospel. He's consecrated to the gospel. His whole identity is formed around the gospel. It's his calling, his mission. It forms his understanding of reality. And so he begins his letter by providing a definition of the gospel, starting in verse 2. He says the gospel of God is the fulfillment of Old Testament promises, promises given through the prophets in the scriptures, concerning God's son, who is a descendant of David, and declared to be the son of God by the power of the Holy Spirit. That's Paul's summary of the gospel. If you're ever wondering what the gospel is, that's it. Right there. All of those things combine to provide a definition of the gospel. Paul continues, though. He takes that foundational definition of the gospel, and he kind of expands it in verses 16 and 17 of chapter 1. And these are the famous verses, really, of the whole chapter. He says, he's not ashamed of the gospel. The gospel is God's power to grant salvation, what? To, to whom? To all who believe. To all who believe. And how does God do that? Well, verse 17 says, it's in the gospel that God reveals his righteousness, which is granted to us as a gift with, to those who have faith. So that then the righteous live by faith in Christ. Well, why is God's righteousness the focal point of the gospel? Why is there a need for good news? And that is because of the desperate condition of humanity. We're plunged into the depths of sin, deep, dark sin, because of the curse that Adam brought to us all. The chief reason we need the gospel, and the chief reason the gospel is such good news, is because we by nature all stand under the wrath of God. So what Paul will do then from, let's see, back up a little bit here. Okay. Paul from verse 18 of chapter 1 all the way through chapter 3, verse 20, will go into painful detail describing the depths of human depravity. In case you're wondering, what does it look like to be a sinner? Paul's like, well, let me show you. Um, and, and these are painful verses, Paul will be relentless, almost ruthless in his searching and probing, taking us down to the depths of our twisted and wicked hearts. He wants to push and push and push until finally climaxing to his summary statement in chapter 3, verses 19 and 20, where basically he says, there's nothing we can do in the face of God's righteousness. We stand without a defense before God because of our sin. So today's talk is a heavy one. It's a solemn one. And Paul wants us to feel that heaviness. He takes his flashlight. Even though 
I have a flashlight. But he takes, in a sense, the flashlight. It's the flashlight of the Holy Spirit, really, to shine into our hearts, showing us things we don't want to see, revealing things about ourselves that we really don't want to admit. But Paul is determined that we will be left with nowhere to hide. Why? Why does he do this? And he's writing this letter to a church he's most likely never been to. And this would not be a happy letter to receive. Hello, I'm Paul. Nice to meet you. God's wrath is upon you. That's basically what he says in this letter. But why does he do that? Well, until we have plumbed something of the depths and subtleties of our own sinfulness, we may talk about how amazing grace is and sing about how amazing grace is, but we'll never really truly understand and feel that grace is amazing. But when we know that there's truly nowhere to hide <laughs> from God's perfect searchlight of righteousness, the only response is to cry out, God be merciful on me, a sinner. And at that point, we'll be in the position to taste the sheer blessedness and gloriousness of the gospel of Christ as we cling to him and him alone. And this is eventually what Luther realized. It took him a little while, um, but he eventually realized that. So um, turn with me to Romans 2. If you do have your Bibles, we're going to continue along this path, staying in Romans 2 primarily. And we'll notice along the way that um, Paul highlights three things about God, the righteous judge, that are meant to show us clearly why we need the gospel. So the first is, um, God, the righteous judge, judges our hypocrisy. Verse 1 of chapter 2. Um, and right away as it begins, Paul says the word therefore. So I want to talk about that. What this let us, lets us know is that we've come to one of the many hinge sections in the letter. Paul has listed the way in which the judgment of God has been revealed against the pagan Gentiles, uh, all in chapter 1. And now he turns from talking about pagan Gentiles to the sins of the hypocritical person who thinks, oh, I'm, I'm actually not all that bad. So it's almost as if Paul's addressing someone who has been thoroughly agreeing with Paul up until this point. It's like, yeah, I agree with what you're saying. As Paul has outlined the depths of the sin of the pagans, and just, I'm, I'm going to read this to you. Um, chapter 1, verse 29. Listen, listen to this so you get to feel some of the heaviness. Paul says, they, the pagans, they're filled with all manner of unrighteousness, evil, covetousness, malice, envy, murder, strife, deceit, maliciousness. They're gossips, slanderers, haters of God, insolent, haughty, boastful, inventors of evil, disobedient to parents, foolish, faithless, heartless, ruthless. They know God's righteous decree that those who do such things deserve to die. And they don't only do them, but they give approval to those who practice them. And it's as if there's this person, maybe in the middle row, maybe in the back row, who's been nodding his head. Yeah, those pagans. Condemn them to hell. They're full of envy. They're full of murder. They deserve hell. And here in chapter 2, verse 1, Paul turns and says, Therefore, you <laughs> have no excuse, oh man, you who judge others. Because you're actually doing the exact same thing yourself. It gets pretty uncomfortable at this point. Um, and Paul's goal here is to turn from the pagan Gentiles to the religious person, the person in the pew, the Jew, right? Paul was a Jew. He's addressing a Jew. He'll say this explicitly later in, in later verses in chapter 2. He's, he's addressing a self-righteous Jew. Or, in our context, a self-righteous churchgoer. <laughs> um, and he's judging the, the practice of inwardly cherishing sin while outwardly keeping up appearances. And Paul gets uncomfortable <laughs> um, as he... Uh, uh, continues to outline God's righteous judgment. He'll continue on. Um, verse 2. He says, We know that the judgment of God rightly falls on those who practice such things. So God's judgment is right. The ESV says rightly. The NIV says God's judgment is based on truth. Okay? So God judges according to the true 
reality of the situation, not on the appearance of the situation. Does that make sense? So in order for us to understand this, I want to step back a little bit and talk about God's righteous judgment. This would be theology two. You can do it, though. I know you guys can handle it. Okay, so when we talk about God's righteous judgment, we mean God always acts in accordance with what is right. And he himself is the final standard of what is right. God is not merely righteous. He is righteousness. Thus, he always acts in accordance with himself. He's faithful to himself, always. God reveals his righteousness and thus himself to us through commands and laws. His laws can't be arbitrary or hollow. They always reflect the absolute moral purity and the character of God. God revealed his righteousness through his law from the beginning, very beginning of time with Adam and Eve. God gave specific commands to Adam. What are they called? Creation ordinances, right? You know, hard things like be a gardener in a paradise that doesn't have any weeds. That's really hard. Spend time and build a family with your beautiful wife. That's really hard. Take dominion over the creatures. Okay, be a ruler. Okay, really hard. All in the world without sin. You know, hard laws. Now, negatively, God said, what? One thing. Do all these things, but don't eat from this one tree. Okay, so God, these were God's stated commands, his specific commands that he gave to Adam. But what was underneath those commands, what was behind, what was the motivating drive for those commands, it was that he wanted Adam to love God, right? He wanted, he wanted a relationship with Adam. He wanted Adam to worship, fear, adore his creator. That was God's desire for Adam. What did Adam do? Adam, who was created by God, scooping up a handful of dirt, breathing life into that dirt, if you can think about it, if you're Adam, you open your eyes, and the first thing you see is God's face. <laughs> That's Adam's reality. God's perfect creation. What does Adam do? Well, when faced with a lying serpent, he spits in God's face. He essentially says, I hate you, God. I don't want to listen to you. I hate your laws. I hate who you are. And I'm going to do my own thing. Now, with what Adam did, he plunged the whole world into sin. It had consequences. What does that mean? Does Adam's sin mean that God's law is now broken? Does that mean that God's somehow no longer righteous? Does Adam's unfaithfulness nullify God's perfect standard. Paul will actually ask this very question later in chapter 3 when he's speaking about the Jews. And the answer is no, of course not. <laughs> let God be true, let God be righteous, let God be just, even though every man be found a liar. God's righteous judgments are always right. They have to be, because they are part of who he is. God is righteous. He is righteousness. Does that make sense? So the sinfulness of man can't nullify God's perfect righteousness. In fact, human sinfulness just illustrates how righteous God is and how right he is to punish the wicked. That means there can't be an escape from God's righteous searchlight of justice. The powerful light of God's righteous judgment exposes our presumption. Um, look at verse 3, which I'll read to you. It says, Do you suppose, O man, you who judge those who practice such things and yet do them yourself, do you suppose that you will escape the judgment of God? Paul's asking a rhetorical question, right? The answer is, of course, no. <laughs> but isn't that the case? What did Adam and Eve do when they sinned? They hid. <laughs> like, get me away from God. Because <laughs> I know he sees me, and it's terrifying, and I want to hide. And the reality is, is that God sees into the very secret depths of our heart. Paul will say that specifically in chapter 3, verse 16. What would happen <laughs> if the secret thoughts of our minds and our hearts were projected on that screen? It's terrifying, right? I think we would all run out as fast as possible. It, it's a terrifying thought to think that someone could see within the depths of our minds and our hearts. The reality is, <laughs> they 
are seen. They're known to our creator. They're revealed before him. And in light of this, our only response can be, in Psalm 130, the psalmist says, O oh Lord, if you marked, or if you took note of my iniquity, who could stand? And the answer is no one. When we assume that we're okay, I'm okay. The other people out there are sinners. Hmm? They are sinners. I'm okay, though. Um, that's, that's presumption. That's presumption on God's goodness and God's kindness. And that's exactly what Paul will say in the next verse. He says, do you think that you're going to escape? Or are you presuming on God's riches, riches of his kindness, the richness of his kindness and forbearance and, and patience, not knowing that God's kindness is meant to lead you to repentance. Paul says that God's kindness is meant to lead us away from presumption, away from hypocrisy, and lead us toward repentance. And what's repentance? But a broken-hearted realization of our utter depravity and constant daily turning away from sin and towards Christ, towards the one who can save us. Repentance is not just a momentary conviction of sin. It's a radical turning around of our lives and living for the grace and glory of Christ. And the tragedy is that someone could presume on the riches of God's kindness for your whole life and never really be a true believer. And that's what Paul doesn't want to happen. There we go. That's it. Last one. Yeah. Paul doesn't want that to happen. And that's why he's so harsh in these verses. And it seems harsh. It seems condemnatory. And he wants us to feel the weight of that. My time is almost up, but I want to conclude with thinking about what is, the, what is the essence of the law? What is the essence of the law? What does God truly want? And the answer is, if, if you look down, if you have your Bibles, to the end of chapter 2, verse 29. A Jew is one inwardly, and circumcision is a matter of the heart by the spirit, not the letter. His praise is not from man, but from God. God wants a circumcised heart. And if we had all day, we could talk about this. It's a beautiful concept. God wants a heart that's been cut deeply with the realization of my sin. <laughs> the fact that I have broken God's law. I was there in Adam. <laughs> Adam's my head. I was there. And I broke God's law. And what was the right thing for God to do? It was death immediately. Yet God didn't. God was gracious. God wants a heart that's been broken of its pride and can cry out, save me, oh my God, from my filthy sin. That heart is the heart of a true believer. A true person of God delights not in his own righteous keeping of the law, but the fact that he can't keep the law on his own. On the fact that he needs Christ. He needs Christ's spirit to come and cut out his heart and destroy his sin. And the Apostle Paul knew intimately what it was like to trust in his own religiousness, doing the right thing, going to the right church, going to the right school. <laughs> you guys have got, got that one down. Um, he knew it was possible to be deeply religious and yet not be saved, not be Christ's. Paul knew that because Paul was that person. Paul knew that Christ, by his spirit, had to reach down and powerfully rip out his hypocritical heart and change it into a cut, tender, and broken heart. Luther also understood this. But what Luther did initially was that he tried to do something to make up for his sin, right? He tried to go to confession, tried to literally destroy his body in order to scrape away the sin that he felt in his soul. But it was the reality of Paul's teaching that stopped Luther short. There's no one who is righteous. <laughs> There's no one who does good. All have sinned and gone astray both the outward pagan and the inward hypocrite. And that's exactly where Paul will go in chapter 3, verse 10. There's no one righteous, no, not one. There's no amount of fasting, starving ourselves, going to confession, memorizing scripture, following the law that can save us. There's no inherent righteousness in us. So what's the response? What's our response? 
broken sinners that we are. And the response is to realize that we need the gospel. This is why we need the gospel. We need good news. We need Christ more than we've ever man imagined that we do. Maybe what I've said today is something you're keenly aware of. Maybe you know the depths of your sin <laughs> and you long for relief. Maybe you're like Luther. You, you know that you're a sinner. Well, the response is the same. We need Christ. We need our Savior. We need to rest in him. And maybe the other side sounds more familiar, where you're pretty proud of the fact that you go to covenant, or you're a third-generation covenant grad, or whatever. And the other people, they, they are the ones that, that need Christ. Well, the answer to that is also, you need Christ. <laughs> you need a Savior. And the good news is that Christ is merciful. He will never turn away sinners, broken and crushed from the realization of the deep darkness of our hearts. For in the gospel, we have offered to us a righteousness that's divine, a righteousness that's perfect. It's righteousness that goes down to the deepest depths of our degradation. It lifts us up from our, the filth of our own sin and sets us among princes and princesses. That righteousness alone is equal to our need, and it's freely offered to us as a gift from God through faith, faith looking outside ourselves to someone else, to Christ, to resting in him. We'll talk more of this good news tomorrow, but let's pray. Heavenly Father, we come before you just with joy in our hearts because of who you are as a righteous God, Lord, we want you to be righteous. We want you to uphold truth and justice. And, Lord, we know that of our own strength, we are condemned before you. And yet, Lord, in the gospel, the promise is that we can come before your presence, skipping and laughing and with joy because you're our Father, through the work of your Son, that you have granted it to us, your Son's righteousness. Righteousness that is divine. And Lord, by your spirit, I pray that you would cause us to repent daily, cause us to know truly what it is to rest in Christ. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen.